Okay, hi everyone. Um, this is a 46 online spin training seminar. Uh, this is Kirill Belashenko from University of Nebraska. Our speaker today is Dr. Jamian Hu from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. His talk will be about a phase field modeling of strain mediated control of nanomagnetism. And um, um, let me say a couple of words about the speaker. So Dr. Jamian Hu is an assistant professor um, at the Department of Material Science and Engineering and a Granger Institute for Engineering Fellow at uh, Wisconsin. He received his PhD in science and engineering from Tsinghua University in materials, in uh, Tsinghua University and in materials, is that right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, in uh, 2013. And then he held a postdoctoral appointment uh, at Penn State, after which he joined uh, the faculty at Wisconsin in 2018. Um, um, Dr. Hu received an MRS Graduate Student Gold Award in 2011 and the MRS Postdoctoral Award in 2015. Um, his research focuses on the development and application of phase field models to um, model and design uh, ferroic materials, devices, and uh, microstructure. Um, his current research is supported by the National Science Foundation um, ACS Petroleum Research Foundation and uh, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. So with this, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Jim Young and he'll tell us about phase field modeling um, of strain mediated control of nanomagnetism. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. And hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Young Hu. And first of all, it was a, a great pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, speak in the, this uh, Great seminar, and I want to thank Ching and Korea for the invitations. So today, as Korea mentioned, I'll be talking about our recent predictions of using phase field modeling to uh, to understand and predict some phenomenon that are associated with stream media control of nanomagnetism. Okay. So I'll uh, so I have two topics today. Second. So first one, the first topic is relies on the use of a basically quasi-static strain. You have a piezoelectric material, which you apply voltage to the piezoelectric material. <clears throat> you can generate a, a, a and at least as fast as nanosecond strain. And you can, uh, here we consider the static strain. We, can, we, we, we explore the, the routes to uh, create a skirmion purely using strain from a, uh, we call it quasi single domain. You see this is tilted uh, magnetization around the edge of the nano disc. That's because of the Zalosinski moria interaction between the heavy metal and the ferro magnet. So that's FM and HM. We have a capping layer. This is all purely based on computational design. The capping layer can be MGO to promote the uh, Perpendicular anisotropy can be another heavy metal to strengthen the uh, interfacial DMI strengths. Well, we basically we predict that we can purely using strain, the isotropic biaxial strain, we can switch the magnetic state back and forth between the uh, quasi single domain and the uh, skirmion state. Yeah. And the second one involves the relies on the use of the ultra fast acoustic pulse, which we generated from the uh, uh, infra, near infrared range femtosecond laser, which is pretty typical, was uh, done by first in Brown in 1980s. The Thompson paper, they predict, they observed that it can convert a uh, femtosecond laser into a picosecond acoustic pulse. And we have a model that can couple the elastodynamics with the micro with the micromagnetics. And we use that to predict that in certain conditions, and tuning the thickness right, and we can uh, uh, excite the narrow band terahertz spin wave. You can see this is uh, the uh, frequency spectra, the special resolve. This is uh, thick in the thickness along the thickness direction of the magnetic layer. Um, basically, we have a narrow band, which is shown the spectra was on the top, was shown here, which is 
quite narrow and different from the existing work on the spintronic emitter. You direct, in that case, you directly shining a laser on top of magnet. Okay, so this is uh, two predictions, one static strain, one actual fast strains, and we have observed some uh, phenomena. Yeah. But before we jump to the topic, let me introduce myself a little bit. So I, uh, I got my bachelor's degree from Sichuan University in materials physics, 2008, and I did my PhD in material science engineering uh, in 2013. But during which I spent two years as an exchange student working with Professor Lang King Chen and Penn State University. And after that, I went, I continued there as my postdoc and research associate until I joined Wisconsin in 2018. So two, three students so, so far, Ming Yi Dai and Shi Hao Zhuang, they are two of my first graduate students. And Ming Ri just joined this year. Okay. I'm planning two research directions in my uh, my group right now. One is more like a continuation of my uh, my announced work on the ferroid materials modeling. Uh, we are I did trying to use a model to try and find something, see if I can predict any new phenomena, and or design some new device concepts. I'm interested in modeling magnetic materials, ferroelectric materials, and their composites, and modeling ferroid materials, and also do the uh, machine learning works on the microstructure informatics. We do a, we predict that a microstructure property relationship and the evolution of microstructures using the deep learning models in collaboration with a professor in computer science department here in Wisconsin. And in terms of magnetics, in the field of magnetic materials modeling, we did develop our own models. So we did a, a one model did by uh, uh, Ming Yi. She did this uh, atomistic spin dynamics simulation package. We call it Atom Mac, and it's fully GPU, GPU accelerated. You can see from the uh, more initial uh, scaling performance analysis, you can show that the, again, the speed is at least 16 times higher than the single CPU. And we can say um, right now it's getting faster than this. And the model is uh, fully benchmarked. We compare that with the Mac and also compare the profile of magnetization through the, uh, uh, with the analytical calculation. This is atomistic experiment, which is only 1.8 nanometers. Uh, we did by atomistic model. And we use that to demonstrate this spin orbital switching in the uh, nanomagnets. And the, the topic today is mainly focused on this micro, we call the micromagnetic phase field model. And the difference from the conventional micromagnetic simulation is that we somehow couple the, mag the uh, magnetization dynamics with the lattice dynamics. So there's two way, it's two way coupled, not just the one direction from the effects of strain on, on the magnetization dynamics, because the magnetization dynamics going backwards through the magnetoelastic feedback, you will influence the phonon and lattice in, in, in the materials. We, that can be important in some cases, especially like you can see this is, we, we think it'd be useful for magnetic spintronics and potentially some material in spin calorytronics. And we demonstrate that as two examples we'll, talk, we'll cover today. One is um, essentially the mechanic switching of magnetic skirmions and ultra-fast magnet, magnetoacoustics. Yeah. Okay, and with that, let me start uh, with my first topic. Um, again, we're trying to find a way, can we predict simply, purely by string, can you switch the states? This is, this is writing a skirmion. <clears throat> you can, if you switch it back, there'll be deletion of a skirmion. Yeah. Or a little bit, little bit of background on, on this skirmion, this quasi-particle. It was named after the British particle scientist, Tony Skirm, like Fermi, Fermion, Skirm, Skirmion. So they had two types of quasi-particles. One is block skirmion, is also called spiral skirmion, which we can, it's a stereographical projection of this uh, quasi particle. One's blah, one's a neo. So you can, you can imagine this will be like a globe. You can cut it open from the top and you fold it. And then you can, uh, you can see the spin vectors essentially in this pace will pointing down and, uh, and the, the, edge, the vectors on the outside edge will be pointing up. And for neo skirmion, it's also like a hedgehog skirmion, they call or cycloidal skirmion. 
you can do the same thing by cut the sphere open from the top and gradually flatten it. Like a, it's like a globe into the world map, the stereographical projection, you would have the uh, vectors in sign pointing down and the vectors all sign pointing up. And they are following a spatial chirality. In this case, it's the left-handed chirality, which we'll talk in a second, was determined by the, uh, the sign of the DM interaction, which uh, with the Moria have really nice symmetric arguments from this very classical paper, which show that in this type of uh, interface, the D12, the vector, the, uh, the, uh, the figure is long or some lower alignment of the two spins, which it has to be pointing down these directions. And that was observed by the, uh, in 2011, uh, by the, uh, the very nice experiments, almost like, almost an iron monolayer is like putting very, very small. That can, that can high density. Um, skirmion can be utilized for base, for memories, and, and also because of its fascinating fundamental properties. Okay. So uh, a bit of the chirality of it is called neo skirmion because this, you can understand this is like the, the neo wall and you rotate it by 360 degrees, you, you will form this kind of spin structures. You can see, again, the chirality here was determined by the, uh, uh, in, in a continuous form, this would be the expression of the uh, energy density for the DM interaction. And you can, if you consider this is like X, the axis, you can clearly see, that, well, not so clearly, you, that, that after some analysis, in this case, for example, there's no Y component, and uh, you'll be uh, saying that based on the picture, based on the schematic drawing here, you see when D is positive, you will always favor this kind of uh, chirality. It's left-handed in this case. Okay. But also you can say for the same neo wall, you can put it in both ways. In this case, these two, they, are, they have the same chirality because you look at this uh, wall here, it's always going from like, like this way. Like the same cycloids, yeah. but they. But how do we distinguish this two different spin textures? They can we can use this so-called topological charge number. Essentially, we'll talk about in a minute. For example, if you look at this, if you use this equation, and that particle will have the uh, topological charge number of negative one. Like you can see, this core has a downward pointing vectors, which is negative one. And the right hand side have an upward pointing vectors, which is a positive one. Okay. And you can also run a similar simulations for the uh, you can have for the uniform domain, like there's no gradient in this case. You can immediately say that the uh, terminal charge number will be zero. We can, and also we can do that for a perfect ideal vortex where the vectors the surrounding it is fully in plan and we have vortex core in the center. In that case, they have a top of the charge number of 0 0.5. That's why sometimes the vortex is also called the half skirmion. Yeah. So we'll, so later when we're doing simulation, we're gonna check the topology of the spin texture we're simulating and uh, how can we switch from this uniform domain into one of the skirmion states and, and switch the back all by strain only. Okay, okay here's the model we use. Like I said, we, uh, we're really considering the entire thing as a, as a system. It's an elastically inhomogeneous system. We consider the elastic modulus of a substrate, like a PM and PT, for example, the period of electric materials. We can consider the uh, uh, elastic modulus of the, uh, the magnetic materials and including the surrounding air. And why is that important? Because for this kind of uh, nanostructure, if you're applying the strain on top of it, by applying strain, in that case, it really means what we are we are stretching or compressing the bottom surface of the disk. So in that case, you can imagine there will be some relaxation going on near the edge of the disk. So if you're showing the distribution of X, X components, there will be some relaxation near the edge. And how does a non-uniform strain distribution influence the spin texture? You need that to the accurate modeling of that, you need to come coupling you need to couple the uh, LLG equation with the, the non-NFG-Skimber equation with the mechanics. So here's a, the one of the typical skirmion structure we simulated, and we benchmark our results or phase field modeling 
with uh, finite element modeling. So we check that by uh, simulating the equilibrium strength distributions across a disk. You can see they obtain very similar results. Although our model is faster in that case, uh, the, I'm not bragging about it, but it is faster about, than the finite element in this particular case. Um, okay, so if we want to do a switching, I think the first step is to check the thermodynamic stability of these different spin textures, especially if we want to see how do we switch from the quasi single domain state into a skirmish state. I think it would be valuable to first evaluate their relative thermodynamic stability first. Okay, so here is a first diagram showing the uh, the x-axis is that disk diameter we are simulating the disk and the interfacial DMI strength. So normally the first diagram will only show the stable state that you, you can see from here, there's a stable state. Um, but here I'm, I'm making a move to trying to put the uh, meta stable states on the same first diagram also. So here's one way the graph is about. I'm trying to use, represent one spin texture with one uh, uh, with one line pattern. So whenever you see the three types of line patterns in the particular data point here, for example, this uh, 400 nanometers and this 0.75 millijoules per meter, per meter square, you have three different line patterns crossing over left, right, and, and straight vertical. That means all these three types of spin texture can be stabilized at this throughout some dissemination, they show you can remain stable. Okay. But their different color means different thermodynamically stable state. Like in this case, the skirmion is low stable. Yellow means the stripe domain have a near wall, which is low stable. And blue means the quasi single domain is low stable. So as you can see from this graph that whenever you see, first of all, the skirmion always come with an intermediate intermediate the inter interfacial DMI strength. Okay. If it's too large, the stripe will become favorable. If it's too small, a single domain, a quasi single domain is going to be favorable. And second, for any skirmish state, it always comes with two, at least two meta stable states. So there'll be three nine patterns crossing over, but here you can see there's only one pattern. That means the other two states won't be stabilized in that case. But here, which is good because you can, we have multiple meta stable states, you can potentially switch from one state to another by making the, by jumping over the barrier. Yeah. So yeah, that help us to choose what kind of starting point we should, we should, we should use, what, sick, what disk diameter we should use and what DM, DM interaction strengths we should choose for subsequent simulation. And that will also influence the magnitude of the critical strain that you'll be needed for making the switching. So here's some quick, I won't go into the details about this, but I think we did some uh, very more detailed study on how does the interfacial DMI strains change the, uh, we call this intrinsic energy, it means uh, basically all the energy combined here. Um, you see uh, the uh, one observed version that is the skirmion state the energy is pretty similar to the stripe. And the, or the, or even when it is a thermodynamic stable, like this point, it's only slightly smaller than the stripe domain state. Okay. The DC is a kind of the critical, the smallest uh, interfacial DMI interaction that will need to stabilize the skirmium. Yeah. And we also take the size dependence by fixing the interfacial DMI strains. In that case, you will see that uh, when the uh, disk diameter is uh, high, greater than the spin second order period, which is about 320 nanometers, the uh, formation of multiple skirmion in the same disk becoming more favorable. And below that, and then they, uh, it's, well, still, still stripe will have the uh, lower, lower energy in that case, at least uh, for most of the time. In only a very small window, the skirmion will have the uh, uh, lower energy in that sense. And when, if the disk diameter is too small, you will see that the uh, um, skirmish state will be becoming highly meta stable. Even in our simulations, we have to use a different cell size to make it stable. Um, so yeah, that will mean it's pretty hard to get that 
scarring state stabilized in that case. Okay. So here's a, a key information uh, from the first topic, which is about the, how can we use strain to switch the state from one way to another. And again, using strain is potentially no power because you're now not using, uh, uh, not using spin current, not using spin polarized current, and that's dissipation is. So here we have three panels. The first, the first top panel shows how the average perpendicular magnetization change as a function of time. Once you, this is our disk, all red means the initially quasi single domain state, which start from the topological charge number of zero, and you are applying a biaxial strain about 0 0.4, and stretch it biaxially, isotropic strain, and you can actually, and you leave the strain on, and in equilibrium, you can, you can push that state into the metastable scalar state. It's metastable because the equilibrium intrinsic energy is higher than initial energy. But that, that energy doesn't take into account elastic energy, which we'll show you in the next slide. If you're adding in the elastic energy, the whole thing will be the free energy minimization process. The energy will always go down. And one notable feature I would like to mention that first of all, it's pretty oscillatory. So it's not directly from quasi single domain state to a skirmion, but rather it will go through this kind of periodic process with a uh, one of the call, if I can call it the transitional state here, you can see this is a corresponding spin texture where the, uh, the gray color means the vectors are pointing in the line down in the plane is approximately a vortex and it's consistent with its uh, topological charge number is about 0 0.5. And it's a proxy at the peak, and the peak of this uh, profile. Yeah. And of course, on equilibrium, the topological charge number almost reaches a one, which is shows that it's indeed a skirmion. And we did, the, did a careful energy, energy analysis. So check how does the energy, different energy contributions evolve when you switch the quasi single domain state into the skirmion, you can see the DMI interaction is certainly decreased because it's forming this uh, a favorable chirality exchange. You from a single domain to a, to a spin texture, exchange energy will increase, and the solid field will increase, the stray field will decrease. So you can from this plot we can see which the process is driven by the minimization of the stray field energy. DMI energy density and the elastic energy. And that, that's a major component. What will, will be at the expense of re enhancing an anisotropy and exchange. And we did that. This is our critical strain, their 0.4 strain. Then we check that at the critical strain point, their uh, total energy, which is intrinsic. Intrinsic means the DMI plus exchange and anisotropy and strain. And then elastic energy it has to be go down, otherwise it's uh, physically unreasonable. So we check that energy energetics and it makes perfect sense. Um, the video, to be consistent with the oscillatory process I just mentioned, you can see this is pretty twisted. I see, so this is like trying very hard to push the big form in the vortex during this uh, transitional process or intermediate processes and going back and forth until eventually you will, you will stabilize in the skirmion state. You take, actually you can see the entire thing takes about 30, 30 nanoseconds. It's pretty long for the simulations. So not, this is not showing the full animation of that, but uh, you can imagine it's like going back and forth. It's pretty, I think I like, I, I like to watch this uh, uh, when I was getting bored, <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we tried it like 0.4% strain in that case. But what happens if you're applying a large strain? Like in that case, you're applying the 1% strain, for example. Or if you, the, the, and the different energy contributions can, uh, uh, can will compete if you increase the strain. Certainly, you have a larger strain. You, the elastic energy, the minimization of elastic energy is going to be, is going to dominate in that case. So that will prefer, preferably push all the spin vectors into the planes of the disk. So that's why you can imagine, you, you can see from here, um, as you increase the magnitude of the strain from 0.5% to the 1%, we 
we just look at the color of it. The color will becoming less blue and less red. That means the uh, more vectors are lying down. And we can check that by looking at their uh, um, topological charge number and equilibrium state. It perfect, it, as you can see, it approach 0 0.5, which is the ideal, which is the topological charge number for the ideal spin, ideal vortex. Okay, so now we have we can we can create a skirmion. We can create a skirmion from the uh, quasi single domain state to the uh, skirmion state, and uh, we can we can do uh, we can push it back by squeezing it. Now we are applying the biaxial compressive strain. You push it, and uh, because of it, this is cobalt iron boron, by the, the, the material we use, and you can. Uh, you have the positive mag magnetic destruction about 30, 32 ppn. And if you push it, all the vectors will stand up. Okay, so then eventually you, you switch it from a skirmion into a quasi single domain state again. And again, in a transitional state, it will have a, a, a sort of like a more like a block wall because they have a higher energy in that case. Okay, okay so we you well, again, we've done similar energy analysis and we compare the, uh, um, the evolution of different energy terms. And it's, it's, very, it's a similar story. And again, you can see from the, the diagram, this division is much faster. Okay, it says it only take about 1.5 or something nanoseconds to delete the skirmion. Okay, so this is, again, this is we are using the critical strain. That is the smallest strain that will be needed in a case to delete Skirmion. So now the question is, can we, what if, like in the previous case, we asked the question that what if you're applying larger strain, can you still create a strain? Can you still create a skirmion? So here, what we are going to do next is to try and say, what if we apply larger strain? Does the kinetics behave the same? Can you still need a skirmion? Okay. So we, before that, we also show that we can uh, do this kind of repetitive, re repeated switching. We can switch it back and forth from a uh, single domain in the skirmion and the single domain and another skirmion. Okay. So yeah, we also went down to map out the entire strand. We will talk about, right now we only focus on biaxial part. Biaxial strand, it is a strand X and strand Y. The by normal strain on X and normal strain on Y, we talk. If you we we mentioned that if you if I tensile strain, you can uh, create a skirmion. You can turn, compress a strain, you can delete a skirmion. This diagram shows that if you start from a skirmion state, so the all the the initial state in all this simulation is a skirmion. So we are so say this is zero zero points. There's no strain when there's no strain applied. It's a skirmion state. And we're starting from that, we uh, apply different combinations of strains. So you can say, as we just discussed, once the uh, long this, I mean, sorry, I forgot the other point. So if you go this point, it would have, you will delete the skirmion. You make the transition from the skirmion to the quasi single domain state here, and which is about 0 0.25 or something, this strain here, this critical strain. And you can, uh, if you're applying the uh, uh, tensile by, by axial strain, if it, first of all, if it's uh, during the range, and it first will, it will first uh, decrease the radius of the, of the skirmion. This is colored by the radius of the skirmion. And if, if the strain is large enough, it will make the transition into the vortex. And if you're into the anisotropy strain, you would, First of all, say if you are starting from here and gradually applying a uniaxial strain along the y direction, you would first deform the skirmion like this, like, like, like something like this, from a circular becoming an elliptical skirmion. And you can, if you're applying strain large enough, the entire thing will be split it right, from, you know, from a skirmion into a stripe. Yeah. So this is all like, uh, more like a, it's just out of curiosity. You want to check what will happen if we more get a more complete a complete information or of what it can do, how and how strain can change us change a skirmion. Yeah. 
again, this is still the talk about equity brands being structured. Okay. Well, we uh, we also going to look at it that say this is like we're looking at the the kinetics of a Skirman deletion. Um, like we just mentioned, if you're applying the compressive strain, you can delete the skirmion. And the y-axis here is showing the, the time that will be needed to delete the skirmion. So it's, it's kind of a counterintuitively, if you apply larger strain, you actually will get lower, slower switching of the skirmion. Sort of like the Wi-Fi signal, if you look at the shape here, it is a different, if you increase the strain, uh, going through the threshold, it, they are switching time, we call SW, the switching time will increase and then decrease, and then increase and decrease. So the, that means in certain, in one of different regimes they here, you clearly can see have one, two, three, four, five different regimes within each regime, if you increase the magnitude of strain, you will have a stronger driving force and therefore faster switching. But since you see this jump, we must look at what what's different here. Okay. And we did that. So you can see that this is from, we look in the x-axis is the time. We show that the perpendicular magnetization evolves as a function of time. And you gradually increase the magnitude of the strain uh, from the like becoming more and more negative. And you can see it's becoming, it actually can took many more cycles to switch it if you, the strain is large enough. Okay. So this is, you can, I think we can understand this, like you have a higher larger strain, you would have a larger elastic potential. Like I, I would like to use this pendulum as example. For example, you, if you're starting from a higher poten gravitational potential cases, you would need more cycles to get equilibrium. Okay. Here is, I think it's exactly the same thing. If you're starting from the higher elastic potential energy and you need more cycles to get equilibrium. So that's why we see whenever you're adding one more cycle and you have see a sudden jump in the switching time, which we define as the uh, this profile gets equilibrium. Okay. So that is, Again, still just the observation. Once we look at this, we are trying to say, can we go a step further to get more quantitative understanding of it? Specifically, is there any analytical model that we can do to uh, better understand this simulation results? Okay. So again, you can see this video, we're showing that we're applying pretty large strain. This is sort of like, this is more like a different form of skirmium breathing. Yeah, it's, not a breath, it's not exactly a breathing mode, people have been talking about, but uh, it's going back and forth, showing this kind of oscillatory behavior. And, and we can look at more carefully that have the uh, two, uh, where we can look at where the MD, which is a uh, uh, auto plane components, which we reach is like minimum, uh, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the minimum and maximum and the point A state, this is a, uh, we can compare and the, then, then this point A, the skirmion radius will be larger. And the point B in the valley, the skirmion radius will be smaller. Okay, like you uh, shrink it, you shrink it, then you, 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 then you suddenly you go back. And that's because of the, again here, in this case, it's a competition between the elastic energy and the DM, D, DM interaction energy. Because you can see from the state A, the chirality is correct. It's left-handed going from down to up, but uh, in the in the in, in the B here, that's going to exactly the opposite, the opposite chirality. That's why we, we we check the energy profile of this elastic energy and DMI energy. It exactly shows the peak and valley as we expected. Okay. And we also observe that the uh, the magnetization on the wall because this is a wall, or this is essentially a neo wall, it rotates in a clockwise manner, which I believe is related to the uh, intrinsic property of the uh, uh, magnetization dynamics. You always always rotate in, in a counterclockwise way according to the LLG equation, precession dynamics. So what we did here is trying to 
using this co called collective coordinates method, we derive the Lagrangian mechanics model, trying to see, can we understand the same phenomenon using an analytical model? What we did here is to try to represent the skirmion by the radius of the skirmion R and the a orientation of the wall magnetization here, which we call this angle phi here. Okay, so we can, uh, the key here is this Lagrangian here, and the most critical part is this so-called uh, potential energy, which is a simpler way to understand this is like the conversion of potential energy into a kinetic energy, right? Just like you, uh, well, the, the Ganineo, the, uh, the drawing balls from the leaning tower of Pisa. This is the, conver the, the uh, conversion of gravitational energy with the kinetic energy. So it's like it behaves in a similar manner. So we derive this, and it's certainly that you can imagine when the wall magnetization is rotating, and when the radius is changing, it will change the different, it will change the straight, en straight field energy, it will change the elastic energy, and it will change the DMI energy. So that all sort of energy contribution will go into this term. And they, I think the useful thing about this model is that we, we only introduce one single parameter, uh, which we need to be fitted from our simulation results. And we can, shoot, we can, we can use that the analytical model can predict the trajectory, how the radius of the skirmion changes the function of time and, the, and how the wall magnetization angle changes the function of time. That's tau is the time period it has two time periods. I mean, the one is the one eighty degree, two is like the uh, three sixty degree, and we we'll also compute the switch in time using the uh, using the energy model. It also agrees generally very well with the simulations. Okay. So to summary, uh, to summarize, we have uh, we can we predict that. So at that time, we, when we did a Work started first in 2015, uh, two years before, but at that time is no experimental work on this uh, uh, switching. And recently, I noticed that there's a paper who was uh, which reports this kind of skirmium switching in the nanostructure uh, pattern arrays. So th that means that this is not entirely impossible. I'll say. Okay, that is the first topic, and then that's more work and. Uh, I'll spend my maybe the next couple of like 15 minutes or so to uh, go to the second topic, which is a more recent work we did. And uh, it's for uh, a little different, a little bit different area in the field of magnetics. Yeah. And we're looking, like I said, we're interested in how the laser, how the laser induced picosecond acoustic pulse drive the spin wave excitation in, in the uh, in the magnet on top. So it's an unequivocal law. We're considering this is like a luminum, this is an M MGO, this is like an iron gallium, we'll talk about that in a later. And we show that um, when you do the thickness right, you control the thickness of the metal transducer correctly. And in some certain, certain thickness of that magnet also, you can generate really high frequency um, of, of almost about it's about 0 0.7 terahertz, and it's pretty robust. It's not. It's not like. It's not like. you not. You will not decay that quickly, and we show that it will be. This will also be able to generate really strong terahertz radiation because this is like the um, terahertz spin wave, according to the Maxwell Maxwell equation, through the magnetic dipole radiation, you will generate a spin. It will generate terahertz radiations, and the new thing about this is a. Uh, you can actually convert a laser pulse into a terahertz pulse, and you will, you will get the narrow band feature in the high frequency regime, which is different from the current understanding that uh, I believe after the MMM3 conference, the, uh, uh, Dr. Mosenberg will talk about this. They have very nice work on the spintronic terahertz emitter part. And here we're looking at different mechanisms. Okay, so uh, to Summarize the, uh, the, the, the a few pioneering work in this field, meaning using the how the acoustic pulse can drive the magnetism change. I know this, this is an incomplete list of the excellent works in this field. 
I think the first paper that I want, I'm aware of is starting from the 2010, where you can use the uh, acoustic pulse, again, a luminum film, but uh, you can generate the precession of the magnetization. You can observe from a time resolved mode, split, the, split the, the, the incident laser pulse into a pump and probe can detect the perpendicular magnetization from it. And also in uh, 2012, there'll be a, oh, another work, but now it's directly pumping the magnetic film. But they did very nice both experimental work and the modeling work using this three temperature model combined with the LLG. They, did, they can explain the results really well. And in 2013, they have a, they can go a step further. There's a, this is a theoretical prediction, which shows that by controlling the duration of the pulse correctly, you can actually realize the 100 degree, 180 degree switching, not just the moderation, modulation of the magnetization, can fully switch the magnetization from one to three, for example, or jump into any one of the two of the four states that are set by the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And also this another work, and also did in the Luminum Ganyan Arsena, the Iron Guardian, did the, and also is the time result mode. So with all this, I think the current status is that the excitation of spin waves in this magnetic layer, for example, by the laser-induced natural fast acoustic pulse was relatively less explored. And what I'm going to present now is that we have a potentially new approach to exciting the uh, terahertz spin wave by ultrafast acoustic pulses. Okay. So, yeah, so to do that, can, I, let me show you, show, show you my result. So you can see here, this is uh, the classical two temperature model. We can model that uh, excitation of the and propagation of the acoustic pulse, epsilon ZZ, how does it propagate in the MGO layer? And once it goes in, go into the iron guardian, here's here, the Z equal to zero means the bottom surface of the iron guardian. And uh, you see the elastic wave are taking the round trip, hitting the top surface of the iron guardian and go back. And most of the wave will just left with a very small wave and still going on in, 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 the, in, in the iron guardian film in that case. And you might, because we are doing a fully coupled model, there'll be some uh, weaker wave, which, which is the secondary elastic wave from the magnetization dynamics that will also have a tiny portion of influence on the results. And the more important part is that you can see this is showing the spin wave propagation in the iron gallium film along the thickness. So the new the key thing here is that although the strongest post signal of the spin follow the lead of the elastic wave, but there will be some portion of the spin wave that arrives faster than the elastic wave. Like here you say it takes like 80 picoseconds for the elastic wave to arrive at the top surface because of the sound velocity of the iron gun is about 4,000, 5,000 picom, 5,000 meters per, meter per second. But here is only take about 40 picoseconds for this spin wave to arrive at the top surface. So that led us to think there must be some additional mechanisms besides the pure magnetoelastic coupling. So that's why we did the Fourier transform for the uh, spin wave with a spatial temporal profile of the spin wave. That is, uh, we get the uh, thickness dependent frequency spectrum on the spin wave. And that one shows that at the top surface, you have a narrow band factor and then high frequency about, which is about 0 0.73 terahertz. And then we went down to did the spin wave dispersion relation for by performing another 2D Fourier trans fast Fourier transform. Then we see two branches on the on the on the uh, omega versus the wavelength frequency. This a linear relation can be fitted perfectly by this uh, linear formula, where the Vs is the sound velocity of the iron gallium. So which means they, they kind of indicate the spin waves along this linear branch was purely driven by the magnetoelastic coupling. But there's also a parabolic relationship, which we derive this relationship by uh, linearizing the LLG equation, by assuming only exchange field is present in the equation. 
and we can uh, fit the parabolic relationship with this curve. Okay. But suddenly there's now, you can see the, uh, the modes are discretized, means that the power is not, you cannot find uh, the wavelength is not, like there is no wavelength here in the simulation, but they can still generate the trend or base this parabolic relationship. And to do that, we did two control simulations. First of all, we turn off the exchange coupling. In that case, we only see a linear dispersion. It's not dispersion in that case, there's linear relation in that case, indicating that there's purely magnetic origin of the spin wave. And we also did a Fourier transform for the time period where the strain has already left the magnetic film. In that case, we only observe the pure parabolic relationship. It's a pure exchange coupling mediated ring, a spin wave. But you can see if we do that individually, there's no high, fre high frequency terahertz wave. Only when both are non zero and are both are relatively significant, you will see this kind of a, a occurrence of the high frequency exchange wave. <clears throat> that is a new thing that we that I think is a new thing we discovered. Okay, it's sort of related to the magnetic phonon coupling in that case because the wavelength of the phonon is equal to the wavelength of the magnetic. Okay, so yeah, so the key message here is they have a high frequency spin wave appears only when exchange coupling and the magnetic elastic coupling are both suppressible. And we did more detailed study on how the spin waves, which we plot, now this is plotting the real space profile of both the spin waves, which is the red shade, and the elastic wave is the blue shade, with a t equals zero is a time moment where the acoustic wave arrives, enters the magnetic film, and the vectors here are the tilted magnetization in the magnetic film. And you can see that there will be a portion of the high frequency spin with, with really small wavelengths, about only seven nanometers, that is uh, the terahertz range. Whenever you, and the very from most, from most position of the elastic wave, the blue one, once the vectors get tilted, there will be an exchange, it will be exchange spin wave launched during the process. I can, you can, you can do that by see once one vector is rotating, so the exchange company will be launching a really high frequency exchange wave. And that travels about twice as faster as the original elastic wave. So I can draw an energy using like, you can imagine the, the some, in some sense, the spin waves, spin waves are riding the elastic wave. So when the elastic wave are propagating at a constant speed, it's like an aircraft carrier is moving on the, in the sea. But in the aircraft carrier, there'll be uh, some faster aircraft like jet plane is it, uh, launching from the, it, which has a faster speed. So the whole, whole process, like the higher frequency spin wave itself, if, if, it, if we do not have the elastic wave that was pushing it, this one itself will decay pretty quickly. As you can see from here, it already decayed because it has higher energy that easier, easier to decay. But now you have an elastic wave, which is like the carrier, which is constantly regenerating this kind of high frequency exchange, exchange wave in the system. That will make a significant difference. That kind of make the signal not stronger than that because you can, now we have a variation of the spin in such a short distance. That means we'll give really strong radiation in that case. And we are, uh, to put in more quantitative analysis in that process means the phase velocity of the spin wave is equal to the sound velocity, which is the group velocity of the elastic wave. And by doing that, we can derive an analytical equation only by, there's no simulation involved in this case, but only uh, we can derive the characteristic frequency of this kind of high frequency spin wave which is only a function of the exchange coupling, saturation magnetization, Gilbert damping constant, and sound velocity. Meaning there's a lot of design stuff that going on. You can design the elastic modulus, can, you can, can control the, the sound velocity, you can tune experimentally, you can uh, control the varying parameters of this uh, exchange coupling and saturation magnetization, 
through which you can tune the central frequency of that peak, meaning that you can use one head structure to access different sorts of uh, frequencies. Okay, to do that, to prove that we are right about that, we, uh, we compare our simulation results, we change the different uh, saturation mechanization, we change the, the, uh, the exchange coupling coefficients, and we uh, compare the numerically simulated center frequency of the, of the terahertz uh, peak and uh, the, uh, the nine sign analytical model, uh, in that model, just equation, a very simple equation, but the dots are simulation results. And you can, they can operate pretty, pretty well, I'll say. And you can, under certain circumstances, you can uh, vary the frequency by quite a bit in that case. And remember, now we only try one single material. If you, this principle, I think they can apply to many different materials also. That gives a lot of uh, design flexibility. So and we think that this scheme may be potentially useful. So we did, we did the Maxwell, uh, we solved the Maxwell relationship, relationship equation in the frequency domain. Again, following the pioneering paper of the original spintronic terrors away, they checked the magnetic dipole radiation in the very first paper in 2013, then on natural nanotechnology paper, they did that. We appreciate about, we, we applied the same model, but we now focus on the magnetic dipole radiation and we consider the absorption of the electromagnetic radiation by the metal. And, all, 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 and we validate this calculation by comparing with console and everything works okay. And we see clearly three different uh, wave packets for the emitted. This is electric field component of the electromagnetic radiation. And you can see in the second wave packet, it contains the uh, um, a high frequency component and low frequency component, which is can reflect it on their frequency spectra. And the good thing about this is that the high frequency peak, it absorbs most of the energy meaning it's useful if you're gonna somehow, you can filter out the low frequency components. You can only leave a really nice single peak in high frequency regime. That you can make it useful for either sensing or imaging in the field of terahertz science and technology. Or at least it can be used as a probe to detect what's going on in, the, in this material system. How does this, because this is not, it will be hard to detect within time result mode because it's pretty surface sensitive and time result mode, you, uh, unless you can concentrate a single on the very top surface of the top layer. So in our simulation, we check the average magnetization of a few layers that get very different signals. Okay. So yeah, with that, I would like to conclude with my, 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 my presentation today. And I talk about two uh, recent computational predictions uh, we made. One is about using the uh, essentially very slow or static strain to switch the skirmion. Like in the left, you can see uh, um, in applying bi axial strain, you can switch the skirmion back and forth. Sort of like chemical reaction, but it's different, it's phase transformation. Um, on the right hand side, we predict that you can use ultra fast strain to generate the very narrow band terahertz spin waves. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time for uh, listening to my talk and I'd be happy to take any questions and discuss with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jimian. So we can now take questions from the audience. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, if you are in Zoom, please use raise hand uh, feature and wait to be called upon. If you can't find the raise hand button, you can send me a private message through chat. Um, the raise hand button is in the participants panel. So Matthias, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Um, yeah. One is um, fundamentally when you change the strain, you can not only affect via magneto elastic coupling the effective anisotropy, but strain can also change the DMI constant, can change yeah. the exchange constant. So there, there are more things that fundamentally can happen. Um, right. Are you looking at that? Right now, we are not looking at it, but I think the, because we do not know what is a, we do not have that parameters go, going on. But we, what we did is that we just tried a few 
So we, we, we make this phase diagram. Uh, so at least we take the, to, we consider the variation of the of this D. So we 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 show that this kind of switching can happen along a different range of the D. So I mean this not only happens to along particular data point. And we did not we did not consider the change the modification on the uh, damping parameter and exchange parameter and things like this. But we but did, actually yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, we recently have some collaboration with uh, experimental this they, uh, they did observe the kind of behavior is showing that once you apply a strain, they deal with the BLS to see the DMI, it uh, does change. But that, um, the magnitude of that is not quite significant. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but what we believe that gen, the, the main thing here, like you said, could be different mechanisms going on, like the change of DMI, but here we're only look at the minimization of elastic energy. We think that's also a important uh, mechanism we should look at. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, DMI could even become an isotropic or something like that. So it you yeah, know, exactly. can, can get very yeah. wild, but it needs to yeah, yeah. That gets right. a very basic question because I'm a magnetism guy and I'm not a, a strain or a mechanical guy. Um, so you said in the beginning, you can choose the phase field model or this finite element. So how do you decide whether you use phase field or finite element? When is one better than the other? Or what's the, you know, how do you choose? Oh, yeah. So in this case, as the finite element, for example, uh, you can you can do that with a console, for example. But they can couple the, you can write your own LLG equation. You can couple with a different elasticity module. But the, the thing that we found that the speed of that is not good enough. For the, for is for if you're running around a huge amount of simulations, but in our model we have this uh, we have a spec uh, with discretized the system in like a QB cell we have a a, a very good algorithm we can solve the equation in Fourier using the so-called Fourier spectral method which is much faster than the finite element, so that's why we're using our phase field model. Okay, great, thanks. Yep, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Shen, please go ahead. I mean, this, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, my question is regarding your second part. Yeah. Um, so in your simulation, what you are modeling is uh, you have a laser shooting on the left-hand side of an aluminum film with yes. a specific thickness. So that one generates uh, a, a fixed frequency of acoustic wave that propagating through the substrate and entering the ion gallium film. Is that what okay. you are simulating? Yeah, so you can you, you can control the profile of the acoustic pulse um, by changing the thickness of aluminum, and that will indeed influence the behavior of the spin wave excitation in the magnetic layer. Yeah, so we are, so it's like we we, we predict we calculate the uh, strain profile, and we mm -hmm. and then we calculate how the profile uh, the uh, acoustic pulse change the uh, uh, magnetic signal loss in the magnetic layer. Uh -huh. And the, the strongest magnetization response you found is when the uh, spin wave resonance in the ion gallium coincide with its own uh, acoustic. Uh, so basically, it's the it's a, the the two dispersions cross each other. Oh, you, oh, you mean that? Okay. So yeah, we see. Uh, yeah, because it. You mean yeah, this one. one. Yeah. 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 This this is uh, the the uh, uh, spin wave dispersion and the, also the uh, acoustic wave dispersion. Oh, this is only the spin wave dispersion. And only this only the magnetic dispersion relation. So this is only plotting for this uh, spin wave. But, so, but what is that linear? The linear relationship is the linear one is that you have a spin wave, which is basically follow, travel together with the elastic wave. That you can see from from this one is basically there's a one that goes together. And, but there's a, this one, you look at this two branch, there are some, some spin with that are faster, some uh -huh. spin with that are slower, but there's something that, that, that are together. Uh, that I, and I believe this one is linear and this two are parabolic. I see. Yeah. So actually it seems like, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about this interpretation. The, the, the linear branch seems to be just the acoustic phonon and the um, parabolic branch is the spin wave. And when they cross, you have a hybrid. So of course they can have a bit of an admixture to each other, but it will be small if you're far away from the crossing. 
Um, so the, the, the straight line is mostly elastic and the parabolic is mostly magnetic. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be the case? Yes, that is uh, the parabolic one because you, they can be fitted using this uh, parabolic relation purely based on exchange interaction. So yeah, but I think that like the difference here is that you can you have, I think the picture is you really have something that is pushing the, you keep regenerating the high frequency spin rate. If you, if you do not have that, the itself will decay pretty quickly. And that when elastic waves are moving, you, you have, you, you strain will modify that particular spin here. When it moves, you will slowly the exchange in action, you will drive another spin wave. And this is kind of dynamic process. When the elastic wave is moving, you keep regenerating high frequency terror spin wave. That's, I think that's sort of the uh, interesting behavior that we, we right. But this conversion should only happen in that frequency range where the modes uh, cross. Yeah. So one question I had, so if, if you start with, um, and I think you showed the spectra of the pulses. So the initial pulse doesn't seem to, to have um, high frequency significant spectral weight in the higher frequency range. I think on the next slide, you have a picture with the spectral uh, uh, composition. Sure. Maybe the one after that. No. Okay, or so maybe the one before. Maybe. Um, so you, you showed several oh. se several pulses and the spectral. Um, this one? No, not here. I think it's. Yeah, I, I don't have the spectral for the elastic weight, but I, get, I think, well, I, if I understand correctly, you mean if the, the, the elastic wave is not fast enough? If it itself does not have high frequency and components. Yeah, yeah. So what what's the mechanism for the frequency up conversion when you when you start with a pulse that uh, that doesn't have that? Is that some nonlinear yeah. coupling that generates that? Yeah, if there's no, we actually did that simulation and trying to by say if you can just we can make it simpler by inputting a Gaussian pulse, for example, we change the variation and see what happens. So if that if if it do not have that kind of high frequency component, then you will not have the uh, um we will not have this kind of a high frequency exchange wave. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that, that's a, to answer the simple, you know, simple way to your question. Yeah. You have to, that's why you have to tune the sickness to the right range to make sure this is, a, this is about five picoseconds in duration. If you make a, for example, 20 picoseconds uh, by using a, either secret aluminum or that different, it changed this uh, duration time of the laser and if you have a slower and nothing longer, if you, in that case, we won't get it. I, I check, we check that uh, spin weight dispersion relation that indeed they were not crossing over centrally. Also, if you, um, if you're exciting these hybrid waves, starting from, from, an, from an elastic excitation, it seems like yeah. you should get something like rabbi uh, oscillation. So Somewhat, sorry. Some uh, Rabi oscillations, right? So you, you, you have periodic um, conversion of the signal between um, elastic to magnetic, mm -hmm. like in a two level system where you, you, you have periodic oscillations between the two states. Um, I wonder how that would manifest um, in the uh, spatial profile of, of those waves. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, maybe I, I'm not very familiar with it with the term you you just mentioned, but. Um, okay, we we can discuss later. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, please? So again, uh, raise a hand in Zoom, or if you're on Twitch, just type it in. Um, in the chat bar. Okay, looks like we're out of questions. So let's thank uh, Jamian again. So we can use the reaction bar. Thank you, um, everybody. Um, it was a great pleasure and honor to speak here. Thank and also thank you for your invitation. Yeah, thank you very much.